Hello, uh, my name is Bruce Kane, and I'm the director of the Bill Lane Center for the American West. I want to welcome you to our first Arts West program of the 2021-2022 academic year. Today's event is titled Reclaiming John Steinbeck, Gavin Jones in Conversation with Daniel Alonza Rivers. As many of you uh, know, Professor Gavin Jones is a professor here at Stanford. He is the Frederick Remus Family Professor in the Humanities at Stanford University and has just recently published a book on John Steinbeck called Reclaiming John Steinbeck, Writing the Future of Humanity. And that will be part of the conversation today. He specializes in American literature of the 19th and early 20th centuries. Professor Daniel Lanza Rivers is an assistant professor of American studies and literature at San Jose State University, where Professor Rivers also serves as director of the Martha Healy Cox Center for Steinbeck Studies. Uh, professor Rivers teaches courses in US literature, cultural studies, animal studies, and the environmental humanities. The event will begin uh, with a conversation between Gavin and Daniel, two experts on Steinbeck. And then after this portion, uh, in the last 15 or 20 minutes, the speakers will be taking questions from the audience. Please use the webinar's Q&A function located in the bottom bar to submit your questions to our, uh, to our seminar our web webinar today. Live captioning is also available for this event. To assess the captions, please click the uh, CC icon located at the bottom bar of your screen and select either show subtitle or view full transcript for your preferred option. Finally, I wanna take a moment to uh, recognize our co-hosts for this event along with the Bill Lane Center. Uh, Co-sponsoring this very, you know, this good discussion is on Steinbeck is the Stanford American Studies Program and the Department of English here at Stanford. We're excited to bring Amer Arts West programming back for another year, albeit uh, yet another year in virtual setting. A recording of the conversation will be available on our YouTube and our website after the event. So again, thanks for attending. And with that, I wanna turn the conversation over to Gavin and to Dan. Thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna just share my screen. I have just a couple of uh, slides. I hope everybody uh, can see that. I thought I'd begin just by reading a couple of paragraphs uh, from my book, uh, Reclaiming John Steinbeck, just to give you a little bit of orientation. In my introduction, uh, I make some comparisons between the work of William Faulkner and John Steinbeck. Uh, Faulkner is a kind of darling of the academy, whereas Steinbeck has fallen out of favor. Uh, critics at the time noticed all of these parallels between Faulkner and Steinbeck, for example, there tenacious interest in geography, Mississippi in the work of Faulkner, California uh, in um, the work of, um, of, of Steinbeck. I'm trying to change my slide here, there it goes. Uh, on the left is a, an image that was included in an important anthology of Faulkner's work that appears in 1946, edited by Malcolm Cowley. It's a version of the fictionalized Yupna Patorfa County with the locations of various uh, novels and stories by Faulkner uh, overwritten into the map. And on the right is a similar map included in the first major critical study of the work of John Steinbeck by somebody called Harry Thornton Moore from 1939. And I'm gonna read a couple of paragraphs about these maps uh, just to draw some contrasts uh, and to introduce uh, the book and to begin uh, our conversation today. If Faulkner's map tells a history of Native American dispossession and the legacy of slavery in the South, the map of Steinbeck country uh, see, sets different coordinates, even as its predominantly Spanish names imply a prior history of colonization. Faulkner's map is quartered by roads and bordered north and south by meandering rivers. It seems a self-contained postage stamp, as Faulkner would term it, if always a synecdoche for a larger history. Steinbeck country, however, seems incomplete. An arrow points to Fresno and the San Joaquin Valley where the Oklahoma migrants come, not came to work. The mountains run south to a greater California beyond the Mexican border. The tip of the San Francisco Bay top left 
implies the great city to the north. <clears throat> the ocean ranges west toward Asia. Both maps tell a tale of labor in the land. The plantation labor in the south is continuous with the exploitation of migrant workers recorded in the map of Steinbeck country. We are told that in dubious battle uh, uses incidents in a strike of cotton pickers near Fresno. And over both maps broods authorial presence. Steinbeck is dotted throughout Moore's map, not only in his current and previous homes, but also in the sites where Steinbeck has himself performed work in the landscape, on a ranch near King City, on the new road stretching south of Big Sur. The Steinbeck country is a map about work, about self-making, about education. Steinbeck's mother once taught school near Big Sur, we are told. And then to the very north, we have Palo Alto with the words, Steinbeck went to Stanford University here. Steinbeck is everywhere in this landscape, as if the map is an effort to pin him down amid a variety of interests in an area whose borders are unclosed. Like the map of Steinbeck country, Steinbeck's ideas are sprawling, open-ended, and always extending out to a wider world in all directions, always toggling between different, sometimes incompatible registers of meaning. If Faulkner's interest in race focused in his map on the slave plantation has helped maintain his position at the heart of 20th century American literature, then Steinbeck is equally preoccupied with this great American subject. Yet Steinbeck's understanding of race is quite different from Faulkner's concern with slavery and with the haunting problems its legacy poses for Southern history. Steinbeck's idea of race is not centrally concerned with the binary of black and white, but with the Western conquest and destruction of native and Mexican peoples, and with the continuation of a Mexican and Spanish presence in the West. It is connected with successive waves of immigration, not just from Mexico, but also from the Philippines, Japan, China and subcontinental India, often in response to the seasonal needs of California's enormous agricultural sector. It is an idea of race that looks outward to distant borders, to the Pacific Rim and to Mexico to the south. It is strongly tied to the realms of science and medicine, particularly through the eugenics movement, which flourished in the West because of its strong interest in agriculture and nature and because of the regeneration promised by the frontier. For Steinbeck, Race is also about the human race, or rather humanity as a species, and is centered on what Edmund Wilson recognized as Steinbeck's constant and consistent preoccupation with biology. It is tied to a holistic, even transcendental way of thinking about the individual as part of a greater consciousness. Reclaiming John Steinbeck is a book about Steinbeck's struggle to become that big picture thinker, capable of interrogating the nature of humanity as a species, the relationship of humans to the planet and to other life forms upon it, and the structures of social organization that divide groups of people, even as they offer the possibilities of liberation or at least survival. This book is also about the difficulties of that vision, the ways that Steinbeck's prophetic ambitions to think globally are both energized and thwarted by more local and intransigent questions of history and identity, and finally, this book is about how those fundamental tensions in Steinbeck's writing become dramatically visible in the experimental possibilities and problems of literary form. Thank you. Awesome, thank you for sharing, Gavin. Uh, it's a wonderful opening to the book. And I wonder as we're kind of figuring out where to start with the conversation, you could just talk about what inspired you to write a book about John Steinbeck in particular. Sure. Well, Steinbeck remains something of an enigma. He's uh, an enormously popular writer. Obviously, he writes some of the classics of 20th century American literature. Books like Of Mice and Men are widely assigned in, in school. Uh, a few years ago, Barack Obama selected Steinbeck's novel In Dubious Battle as the only novel on a short list of, of central reads. Yet apart from a few devotees, Steinbeck's never really been understood and appreciated by uh, scholars. He's often dismissed as a writer as middle brow and uh, sentimental. It's as if critics don't quite know what to do with him. Uh, he makes them uncomfortable. He doesn't always fit with um, conventional categories. So in general, my work has tended to gravitate towards 
uh, understanding problems and, and difficult ideas in um, American literature. And Steinbeck represents, I think, a, another problem, another kind of uh, a difficult case in the sense that he's perhaps our most read but least studied uh, writer. He's um, curiously canonical uh, and neglected. So what I wanted to do in the book is uh, meet this challenge, uh, that is find a critical language to bring the fascinating contradictions of Steinbeck's uh, work um, uh, to light. So that was the major motivation for writing the book. Um, I also um, was, was interested in writing and focusing an entire book on a single author. I've never really done that before. And, and this has, has really been interesting to me. It's allowed me to combine biography with uh, literary analysis, to patiently explore a writer's development over time in regard to the place where he lived, which happens to be the place where I live, uh, and also to look at manuscript materials and to uncover a kind of secret history of a writer by looking at his manuscripts at, at Stanford and elsewhere to illustrate his mind and uh, his, his creative process. Awesome. Well, with that in mind, uh, why do you think, I mean, why, so that answers sort of the why think about Steinbeck or study Steinbeck and why bring him into the conversation now? But then also as readers, why do you think it's important that we read Steinbeck today? Or how is he relevant to a general? Right. How, how is he timely as, as a writer rather than, you know, he's often associated with the Great Depression with the 1930s, right? He's often seen as a, a sort of a nostalgic writer who's just historical evidence for something that happened in the past. Um, well, that's a view that I'm really trying to overturn. Uh, Humanity obviously is facing a number of challenges, the global pandemic, uh, climate change, uh, the widening of racial and social inequality, a number of political threats to the foundations of our democratic system. These are all topics that fascinated Steinbeck and that I deal with uh, in my book. Uh, first of all, his primary vision was biological. Um, when he was a student at Stanford, he quipped that he wanted to take a course in the medical school on the dissection of cadavers because he wanted to understand more about people. And it's a great anecdote because it re reveals how he's such a biological thinker, such an interdisciplinary thinker. And it reveals how his vision uh, of humanity was uh, a vision of humans as a species, right? He was interested in our biological selves, our interconnectedness, our vulnerability, how we're capable of profound shifts in behavior and consciousness in response to um, environmental change. So Steinbeck uh, is very much an important ecological thinker uh, in relation to this as well. For example, uh, I have a chapter on his second novel, uh, To a God Unknown, which is not one of his best known novels, but it's a very interesting novel because Steinbeck turns to early climate science uh, in order to explore the impact of drought on psychology and society. So he becomes interested, as he is in The Grapes of Wrath, in uh, climate migrants, that is, groups who are forced to move because of environmental catastrophe. This is a, an issue that we're going to be facing um, uh, with, with frequency um, in, in the future. Uh, Steinbeck's Sea of Cortez, uh, is uh, another important ecological work. It's a book that he co-authors with a marine biologist friend called Ed Ricketts. It's about a collecting trip to the Gulf of California. And it again, it, it, it reveals Steinbeck's holistic and, and, and uh, holistic perspective on the interrelation between humans, animals, and the environment, and this kind of precarious balance in which small changes in our behavior can have disastrous environmental consequences. So these are some of the timely issues I think we face. Um, and his works also um, uh, refer to other real real pressing issues of, 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 of the moment. For example, my chapter on the Grapes of Wrath uncovers Steinbeck's interest in the threats to democracy posed by media empires and corporations and, and, and even law enforcement. It's a novel that contemplates the the dangers of living in a post-factual age and the need for a very robust um, and healthy public sphere in order to achieve uh, social justice. I think that's, I mean, I think that's really helpful. One, thinking about, as you're saying, his interest in sort of climate and psychology, but also biology as a, as a mode into understanding persons, right, or people as, as a mode into understanding the social. Um, we can definitely see in the book the ways that, I mean, that the problematics that come up around that at a time of eugenic thinking, 
right? Mm -hmm. um, right. Well, and relatedly, I think um, you spend a lot of time working with the Long Valley. Uh, and I wonder if you can say a little bit about what motivated you to work with that collection, mm -hmm. what stood out to you about it, and maybe how it connected to some of the other interests that you're right. having. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, I mean, the, the context of eugenics, which is just something I know that you've written about um, in, 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 in your work. Um, I know you refer to Alexandra Minna Stern's book on eugenics in the West, which is really fascinating. It illustrates how eugenic assumptions were, were baked into, even the, the, written into the landscape of the American West. It's a really fascinating subject. And we see this, and of course, Steinbeck was a, uh, Stanford rather, was a kind of hotbed of uh, eugenic thinking. So Steinbeck at times resists this, at times, you know, shows the impact of this kind of um, thinking, particularly in, in those stories in the Long Valley that, that you mentioned. Uh, I'm very interested in the short story in general as a genre. It's a very popular genre, but tends to get neglected in comparison with the novel. Um, and Steinbeck was writing during the heyday of the short story as a genre during the 1920s. Uh, and indeed, he receives his education in writing at Stanford in the craft of the short story under the uh, tutelage of somebody called Edith Miralees, who was a legendary teacher of writing at, at, at Stanford. The 1920s was uh, an era in which the short story handbook was very popular as well. Uh, these handbooks promised to teach the art of the short story through very formulaic and, and, and mechanistic uh, rules. Whereas Steinbeck's teacher, uh, Edith Miralees's mantra was that the only way to write a good short story is to write a good short story. In other words, she really liberated Steinbeck um, as, as a writer very early on in his career. She insisted that um, there were no rules in the short story, that, that two short stories should, should never be alike. So the short stories in the Long Valley, which I think is not as well known a, a, a book as it should be. I think it's one of Steinbeck. In fact, I think it's really, in a way, Steinbeck's finest achievement. Um, many of these stories become extremely experimental for Steinbeck. Um, that is, he tries things in short stories that are not really sustainable in a novel. Um, and hence, uh, the collection gets to one of my key arguments that we need to understand Steinbeck as an experimental writer. You know, we tend to see, see Faulkner and the modernists as experimental writers, but, but in his own way, Steinbeck is deeply um, uh, experimental. For example, uh, if we look at the, the stories of the red, in the Red Pony, the Red Pony gets incorporated into the Long Valley, it, it, it provides the sort of culminating stories there. In the Red Pony story, he plays with the idea of character. What he does is he gives his sort of animal character subjectivity, whereas he empties his uh, human characters of interior content, hence uh, making us as readers uh, enter the perspective of non-human animals to see from their point of view. This is part of Steinbeck's broader effort to uh, decenter the human from uh, our perspective of, on, on the planet, post of, part of what contemporary scholars would call his post-humanism. And he does this even more radically in one of his most popular stories, The Chrysanthemums, uh, in which he explores the relationship between humans uh, and vegetables. Uh, I mean, this is a, obviously a huge topic for a boy from Salinas where vegetables take on enormous uh, uh, proportions. Uh, the Chrysanthemums is about a character who develops a, a non-exploitative, passive, receptive, state of being and relationship with nature in which, as I argue in a, in, in a chapter of the book, in which she actually begins to photosynthesize like a plant towards the end of the story. It's a really remarkable uh, um, uh, um, moment uh, in, in, in the story. And it's difficult to imagine that that would be sustainable in a novel, right? So again, it's the, the sort of the brevity of the short story as a form that helps Steinbeck to to, to sort of get out there a little bit in his uh, in his ideas. Yeah, I love that. No, and I love your the way you sit with the chrysanthemums. I'd never noticed before the way her face is constantly turning toward the sun, right? As an example, that sort of vegetative. I mean, the care that he's bringing to the details in that story. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. She, she sort of at, at the end, she kind of yeah. She she just sits there soaking in the sun, and she she sort of flops down and. And she even sort of reaches out towards the, 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 the water heater, you know? So she's, she's like 
stretching a route out towards this source of water. So it's it's really in a way a quite literal um, description of how plants, because we, you know, in terms of our DNA, we're very closely related to plants, and you know, plants communicate, uh, plants move. Some people would argue that 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 plants think, you know, so. Uh, it's a very different way of, of looking at um, our relationship to the natural world and our kind of similarity with things that we would think of as, as uh, absolutely other uh, to us as, as humans. Hmm. Yeah, totally. Uh, and thank you for that. Yeah, if anyone's interested in um, tackling the book, I mean, I'd recommend it and I would recommend rereading The Long Valley as you're reading the book. I think they go together really well. And there's some lovely sort of close readings in there and ways that you're bringing in different perspectives and context. Um, to shift a little bit, I, I'll say my favorite chapter is probably the Grapes of Wrath chapter. Um, and in it, I think that, I mean, there's a just a lovely close reading of the diner scene and in the introduction, but then in the Grapes of Wrath chapter itself, um, there's a, you're doing this sort of interdisciplinary or multi multimodal work, right? And um, one of the things that stands out to me is you're talking about the slow writing, like limiting himself to six pages a day, the sort of thick descriptions, you know, the ways that he's approaching kind of the texture of that, um, as well as that in relationship to the, the sort of politics of the book, right? And toward the end of that chapter, you write, um, quote, there's an incompleteness at the heart of grapes. It is as if the novel leaves us in the middle of a thought, which is, I think, kind of anathema to some sort of I heard grapes of wrath people, but mm -hmm. I, I think there's something really compelling there that I wonder if you could unpack a little bit. Sure. No, I'd be happy to. In a way, this was the most challenging chapter to write because so much, as, even though Steinbeck in general tends to be neglected by the mainstream academy, there's, there's been a lot, of, a lot of work on the grapes of wrath, obviously. Um, such an amazing achievement. It was, you know, it is this slow, careful act of writing, but it was actually written with this sort of urgency in a in hundred days uh, straight, more or less. It's such a vast and compelling novel, um, yet it is kind of messy and inconsistent, you know, when, when you really look at it closely. And it often draws harsh criticism uh, that it's middle brow, that it's sentimental, that it's nostalgic and melodramatic or uh, criticism that it, it uh, whitens the labor force working in the California fields, um, which it does actually, it's very problematic in that regard, or that it simply uses its female characters to stage the power of men. Um, in, in part, that's true as well. So what I wanted to do in this chapter is to respect the greatness of the novel. You know, it is an unforgettable work of righteous anger uh, at the poverty and labor conditions that Steinbeck personally uh, witnesses. Uh, in the mid to late 30s in the Central Valley. It's without doubt one of our most powerful pieces of anti-fascist uh, writing that protests the abuse of the marginalized at the, the hands of um, uh, the powerful. Yet I also, you know, rather than simply celebrating the Grapes of Wrath again, uh, which, you know, I'd be happy to have done, but I wanted to do something different. I wanted to uh, understand how the novel's various failures were operating, how this sort of messiness and inconsistency was actually working in the novel, what the effect was, rather than just simply sort of dismissing it as, 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 as bad writing, as, as critics, uh, critics tend to do. And this brought me to understand how important the concept of emergence is in, in Steinbeck's writing. Uh, it's one of his great themes. He develops it from his reading and thinking and conversations in biology, um, but then takes it and expands it into uh, other areas. Um, and indeed, it's one of his great skills. Uh, one of Steinbeck's great skills was to intuit the emergent. Uh, that is to understand historical conditions uh, at the point of their emergence before they've, they've fully gelled and, and become dominant. He, he calls it writing history while it's happening. And so you, you see this elsewhere in his uh, uh, work. So by emergence, what I mean is a process where new holes are formed uh, from their constituent parts, right? That's what the process of emergence is, the, the technical term from uh, biology. Uh, but in The Grapes of Wrath, what we tend to find is that these parts are always on their way to becoming new holes without ever really getting there, just as the sort of the journey is always ongoing in The Grapes of Wrath, right? And it never really ends. It sort of doesn't exactly end. It doesn't have a happy ending, uh, uh, let's say. Um, so, um, 
this this idea of of always being in the, the the middle of things, always being on the way to a new hole, uh, can be seen in a number of different ways in the novel, actually, and it becomes, I think, a kind of key to understand what Steinbeck is doing. It helps us understand his incomplete characters. His characters uh, never quite gain that fullness or, or roundedness as characters. They're they're always sort of being shaped by their author in a way. It's true of the somewhat vague attempt to offer a social philosophy in the novel. That is the, the theory of the movement from the I to the we, which Steinbeck comes back to now and again in, in, in that novel. Uh, it's as if the book is always trying but failing to express and to clarify these ideas. As, as you say, it sort of leaves us in the, in the middle of something still being worked out. Uh, think of the ending of The Grapes of Wrath. That's another great example. Re remember, well, how could you forget? Uh, Rose of Sharon breastfeeding uh, a starving stranger. It, it's a shocking ending, but it's also um, oddly inconclusive and unsatisfying. Actually, um, Steinbeck's editor uh, wrote to him saying, look, you got to have, you got to change the ending. This is not a particularly satisfying ending. And Steinbeck refused categorically and writes these very powerful letters saying, no, that's the ending. It's got to be a stranger. It's got to be um, this, this, this sort of unsatisfying uh, uh, moment. It's in fact, getting back to your short story question, Daniel, it's, it's much more like a kind of ending that you would find in a short story rather than a novel, which is ironic because it comes at the end of this, you know, enormous sort of great American novel, if you will. Uh, so the chapter explores how this sort of leaving us in the middle of things is really the source of the novel's power. We shouldn't sort of dismiss it as inconsistency or messiness. Uh, that is, The Grapes of Wrath, I think, has been able to en enter into a public sphere and to sort of shape a public sphere because it can contain these contradictions, right? These different interpretations. It can, it can seem both radical and conservative. Uh, it can seem both sort of um, lowbrow and, and sentimental at the, at the same time. Yeah, no, I think that makes a lot of sense, especially when we think about like its endurance and it, as a like a beloved public text, right, in relation mm -hmm. to the sort of critical questions of form. Um, it makes me think of, I can't remember where I first heard this, but there's like a, an insight from cognitive science or cognitive uh, from neuroscience about memory and how the things that stay with us longest in memory are the things that feel unfinished or interrupted. Mm -hmm. We carry that away, whereas if mm -hmm. something that feels complete, it's sort of like, great, our brain can move on, you know? Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. I mean, that ending, again, you know, I remember that so clearly. I must have read the book for the first time when I was 15 or so, you know, and I mean, I, it, it never leaves you, and you always want to kind of return and try and understand that particular moment, so absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Um, well, to, let's I'll keep it moving, and uh, for those in the audience, now's a great time to start dropping questions into Q&A if you have things you'd like Gavin to um, kind of share about from the book or questions about um, the project in general or Steinbeck. Uh, for now, I want to shift. You've got a couple chapters toward the end, kind of like Steinbeck, as you say, um, after The Grapes of Wrath, he was sort of done with the novel for a bit, right, and radically changed focus. Um, in your book, you follow the shift toward Mexico and how Steinbeck approaches Mexico both as a site of scientific inquiry and ultimately as a site of collaboration, one that I think is less known about, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm curious, um, what surprised you about sort of following Steinbeck down to Mexico and the work that mm -hmm. he does there? And to kind of link back to the beginning of the talk, do you think we can expect or hope to see a turn toward the global South and Steinbeck studies mm -hmm. the way we've seen in say Faulkner studies? Right, yeah, no, great question. Well, I've always admired the Pearl, Steinbeck's The Pearl. It was the first Steinbeck book that um, I ever read, um, but I had no idea how extensive was his interest in, and, and engagement with, with Mexico. It's estimated that one third of Steinbeck's works are either about uh, Mexico or Mexican Americans. And it's something that we, 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 we see throughout his work, part of his interest in race and, and immigration in the American West. Uh, we also find some of the earliest representations of Asian American characters in mainstream American literature in Steinbeck's work. Um, so the comparison with, with Faulkner that you bring up is an interesting one. Uh, undoubtedly, you know, Faulkner had an influence on Latin American writers, particularly the boom writers of the 60s and 70s, uh, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez being the obvious um, example. 
But how much did Faulkner really know about anywhere south of New Orleans? I mean, I, I have my doubts that he really understood and knew a lot about, um, uh, about Latin America. Whereas Steinbeck's relationship to Latin America and, and, and to Mexico in, in particular was very different. It's defined by direct uh, participation and involvement in uh, the culture, uh, the journey on the Sea of Cortez in the Sea of Cortez is one obvious example. Um, he helps make a documentary film about water sanitation in a Mexican village. It's called The Forgotten Village. You can watch it on um, YouTube. It's a really fascinating documentary in which he uses the villagers in the Pueblo as actors in uh, the documentary. Uh, so it's a very fraught effort to document but also to lift and educate people out of um, uh, poverty and it's a it's another experiment uh, in the sense that Steinbeck's script actually follows the events of the filming so rather than like writing the script and then filming it he writes the script in uh, reaction to what they're actually uh, filming uh, through this really idealistic hope that um, the villagers will organically accept uh, the need for vaccination and the need for uh, sanitation uh, uh, and therefore sort of create their own story organically, their own story of reform. It actually doesn't work this way and the, the villagers and the, the film crew kind of fall out. And so it becomes a, a story about the limitations of, imitation, of, of intervention and, and communal action. It's very different though in The Pearl uh, and uh, in The Pearl, Steinbeck's uh, novel or novella, we have a yeah a very different interaction with Latin America. It's of course another story about the poverty of indigenous uh, uh, Mexicans. It's a story that emerges actually from a Mexican folk tale that he tells in Sea of Cortez. And then what Steinbeck does is he conceives the pearl simultaneously as a novel and a film, right? So there's the novel of the pearl, there's the film of the pearl. And he helps make the film by collaborating with a Mexican film director called Emilio Fernandez, who's a former hero of the, the Mexican Revolution. He works with him on this, this, this film version, or rather it's two film versions. Uh, there's one version in Spanish for a Mexican audience. There's another version in English for an American audience. And in fact, the first Mexican made film to receive general release in the United States is John Steinbeck's The Pearl. So this is a monumental moment in uh, um, Mexican film um, uh, history. So one of my chapters tells this story of this sort of complex transnational collaboration between Steinbeck and uh, Fernandez, and also a kind of collaboration between the novel and the film and the way the novel relates to the film and, and vice versa. Uh, it's a kind of experimentation in what we might call transmediation. Uh, that is how uh, texts can relate to other media, how novels sort of relate out to uh, a medium such as a film. This is a question that uh, interested Steinbeck in all sorts of other ways. So what I argue in this chapter is the novel is always imagining itself becoming a film. It's a very curious novel in that it it kind of has a soundtrack built into it. And, and there are other ways in which the novel's always imagining itself uh, hitting the big screen and, and impacting its audience. This is what Steinbeck wanted to impact its audience. Uh, and at the same time, the novel is uh, imagining a, a kind of revolutionary possibility. It's a very hopeful novel. Um, I mean, Faulkner's sense of, of, there's no hope in Faulkner, you know, there's no future in Faulkner. It's all, we're trapped in some recursive, traumatic history right whereas the pearl has some hope in a revolutionary possibility in which an individual's renunciation of wealth it's a novel of renunciation when kino throws the pearl back into the water uh, it's a, a story of, of of hope that this renunciation can radiate out into the environment and impact a community towards a, a, a kind of future uh, political change so if i was going to name a sort of favorite chapter that might be it but I think you might have other ideas <laughs> yeah I don't know I think mine might still be uh the grapes of wrath though I did love that one and you're making a great case for it um and thinking about that sort of transmediation or the the thinking about the novel or the novelette as the precursor to film brings me back to something we talked about before about um his turn away from the short story you know like 
after like we really don't get Steinbeck the short story as producing collections like you know I the way that I think we could have but in part I think it's that seduction of film of narrative mm -hmm. the no novelette or the novella into the film and the mm -hmm. sort of audience impact there or experimentation no that's a very good point because of course the short story and film are very related as as, as you know the novel is sort of goes way back to the 18th century but the short story and then and 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 and, and film sort of grow up together. So I think it, it is a, one of the ways in which that sort of short story energy gets transferred in somewhere else in, in Steinbeck's uh, career. Um, well, I know we're at about 2.37. I've got a couple more questions and then we've got a nice healthy um, group of questions collecting in the Q&A, but still time for more. Um, so I think I'll take us to the conclusion of your book where you talk about Cannery Row, which I think is um, I mean, a novel I love, and I think it's a, another one of those wild, widely beloved novels, right, from Steinbeck. Um, and I hadn't realized until I was reading your chapter that the book had come as a response to a group of U.S. servicemen who'd asked him to write something funny that wasn't about war. And so he does Cannery Row. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering, uh, can you say a little bit about how Cannery Row, like what stands out to you about the novel and maybe what it might reveal to us about his readership in general? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Cannery Row, it's, it's really a bizarre book, you know? I mean, I understand why it's beloved, but it's, it's a very strange book. I compare it to a work of abstract expressionism in my book that it's, it's almost purely episodic. It's not quite short stories though, but these episodes, uh, it's full of digressions that, that, that work almost like swooshes of paint on a canvas right it barely holds together as a novel uh, and thus it's a it's a good way to conclude because um it's a kind of microcosm of, of Steinbeck's bewildering variety as a writer it contains so many genres so many modes it's a realist novel it's a symbolist fantasy it's a, a metafictional experiment it's a an exercise in non-teleological thinking as Steinbeck called it in which uh, we go with the flow we immerse ourselves in in, in a pure moment without thoughts of the future, uh, staging this, this, this idea of happiness that we can see formally in the book through um, these uh, uh, various sort of meaningless journeys that are meaningful for the journey themselves and also in the kind of countercultural mindset of, of Mac and the boys. And, and it is, you know, simply fun at some level, uh, even though it, it, it's a war no novel in other ways too. It's sort of written for the troops, but it's also one of Steinbeck's most violent books. And I think it reflects some of his experiences as a war reporter during, uh, during World War II. So I end my book by describing it as a, a novel of renunciation in a way. And, and each of its episodes, it's as if each of those episodes sort of renounce the episode that's come before. It's always kind of moving on in this very Emersonian kind of idea of, of of, 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 of flow and moving on into, in, into the future. And we can understand Steinbeck's career in that way as well. Um, when he raises his curtain, he always puts on a different kind of show as one early critic uh, put it. And, and he does, he writes novels, short stories, plays, plays in the form of novels. He wrote um, uh, screenplays, military recruitment guides. He writes a history of a leader of the Mexican revolution. He writes co-authors a marine biology textbook. Um, and he's always, as you mentioned, frustrated with the novel as a genre, it's kind of clumsiness. Uh, and Cannery Row suggests this too. It, it helps sort of explain, I think, his variety and experimentalism. It's a rejection of the realist novel. And I think um, in, in a way we can understand Steinbeck as a, as a kind of homegrown magical realist, if we want to bring in that sort of global South tradition, Latin American tradition. Um, he, he's sort of fusing these opposite uh, modes together in, 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 in that kind of way. Awesome, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I think um, it's 240, it's a good time maybe to pivot towards some audience questions. Mm -hmm. um, I'm noticing a couple themes and folks feel free to drop in more. Um, one that I can't resist though from Jonathan Candelaria is, um, about uh he's sort of alluding to um murder at full moon right okay so that, that uh john well i'll let you sort of take it away but i think the question <clears throat> generally is just about um this which is, if you folks don't know it's one of steinbeck's neglected novels lives only in the archive uh, and it got quite a bit of press earlier on this year 
Yes, it did. And I got swept into some sort of viral moment. Um, I mean, it's a long story and I won't tell the long story, but it, it was it was kind of interesting. Yes, yeah, Steinbeck writes this early novel called Murder at Full Moon, which I refer to as a werewolf novel. And I call it a werewolf novel because it is a werewolf novel. Um, it's also a murder mystery detective novel. It's a sort of multi-genre uh, book. Um, and it really sort of caught the imagination of people. And so, you know, there were, there's a story in The Guardian and then The New York Times and The Washington Post and The Daily Beast. And it was a question on, wait, wait, don't tell me. And, and it, it, it sort of just, just sort of goes, goes on and on. And um, most recently, actually, there, there was an article in the LA Review of Books. I don't know if anybody reads the LA Review of Books. Um, in which I forget the name of the scholar now, but um, kind of questioned whether it is in fact a, a, a werewolf novel, um, which kind of intrigued me because um, it, it, it very much is. Um, and I think that, you know, that the, the scholar's ideas of what a werewolf is must come from an American werewolf in London, you know, because if we look at werewolfism and lycanthropy, um, it's a very broad spectrum. It actually goes back to the Epic of Gilgamesh and, and, and it's, a, it's a broad spectrum werewolfism of, of psychological and, and, and sort of physical uh, transformations. I mean, the book wouldn't be interesting if it was just a bad detective novel. It's, it's interesting because there's a werewolf in it and because um, uh, it, it, it relates to Steinbeck's broader interest in how humans can transform into uh, non-human animals, right? This is one of the major obsessions with of, of, of Steinbeck. So um, if you have read the LA Review of Books article, uh, take it from me. If it uh, walks like a werewolf, um, if it howls like a werewolf, if it uh, rips people to shreds at the full moon, um, it's, it's uh, probably a werewolf. Uh, of course, I don't want to quote from the manuscript, but I will just uh, paraphrase a moment where um, the, the, the werewolf-like being walks into the room um, uh, and, the, and the description is of it as not being the human character at all. Uh, the, the drawn cheeks and murderous little eyes were those of a, of a beast, of a demon. Uh, the creature crouched and crept across the room. I saw that his feet were bare. This is all sort of paraphrased. The deadly stalking gait was enough uh, to inspire fear even without the horrible bestial light in the eyes. Uh, the horror crept to the desk and opened it with his left hand, or rather its left hand. I've never been able to think of the thing as human. So this is a, such an important moment. Um, it, it's a theme that, that we, we, we find everywhere in Steinbeck. That is, uh, as humans, we're always on the verge of sort of transforming into non-human animals, that we're not, 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 not separate from them, we're connected to them. And so you know, as a scholar, I'm fascinated with, with how that werewolf theme sort of is, is written broadly through his work, but it seems that the public became uh, somewhat obsessed with, with, with the werewolf novel in, in, in other ways, but, but that's all, all <laughs> behind me now. I'm, I'm letting sleeping werewolves lie from, from now on, and I'm not going to unearth any more werewolf novels, I promise. <laughs> You're not championing the werewolf novel to the shelves? Not, not just, just right now. <laughs> well, and I love that passage that you paraphrased too, because it does capture the sort of ethnological gaze, right? Like the, the focus on movement to try to get at behavior, which you play with, or you look at in uh, The Red Pony, right? Which has mm -hmm. slippages between animals and humans. Right. Yeah. How our humanity is very fragile, you know, according to, to, to Steinbeck. And uh, we, we can easily, you know, he has this story called The Vigilante that's based on a lynching in um, San Jose. And it's about how you know, like a quote, you know, common person can transform into, uh, you know, a murderous beast. Um, so that's just one example of, of, of this, this, this theme. So for me, the werewolf novel is interesting because it isn't just like a sort of bad detective novel, um, but it, 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 it's the cauldron of this, this, this broader thematic that we, we see elsewhere in Steinbeck's work. Mm. Yeah. Um, well, we've got... Uh... A nice range of questions, but some themes are emerging. And I guess the first one that I'll toss your way is about um, kind of revisiting or going back to the pearl. Uh, we've got um, someone asking first if what you see or what you think about the relationship between flight and the pearl, 
um, and was flight like an initial sort of mental draft for something that would come through in the pearl? And then the other question is uh, a little bit more directly, uh, do you feel that Kino has had some kind of great epiphany about wealth at the end of the Pearl, or is he just defeated by the corrupting power of riches? Um, and mm -hmm. this person, I think, is questioning sort of his remorse. Yeah. Um, yeah, Flight is another one of those great stories from, um, uh, from, from the Long Valley about a character called, um, if I remember rightly, Pepe Torres, who uh, I, I guess mur murders somebody in a bar fight and then, then flees into the mountains of Big Sur um, and he's kind of tracked by these vigilantes. You know, Steinbeck was very interested in sort of vigilante violence. Um, and, you know, Pepe, um, you know, it, it also becomes sort of animalistic at the end of that story. If you remember the, the, the ending where he's, he's finally shot, there's no escaping these, um, these, these, these vigilantes. Um, and he, you know, he becomes animalistic in his sort of return to, to a natural order as he's killed. Um, so I think that Steinbeck's definitely drawing from flight in the wonderful flight scenes in, in, in The Pearl. But of course, that's not Kino's fate, right? Kino uh, is not shot by his vigilantes and the assassins. He, I mean, he loses his baby, Coetito, uh, through some chance action. Um, but you know, he, 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 he kills them and he escapes and he goes, goes, uh, goes back to the town. Um, so it's, it's very different. You know, there's that, he has that agency, right? The Pepe Torres is a victim. You know, it's a sort of naturalist work in which we, can, we cannot escape natural forces. Um, uh, but, but, but the Pearl is different. That's why I described it as a kind of hopeful novel. So my interpretation would be he, he does reach a revolutionary consciousness at, at, at the end um, and that it is a rejection of not necessarily a rejection of wealth um, but a rejection of the system right that creates inequality uh, and, and and cheats him uh, out of his birthright that's what he's rejecting um, and you know there's actually a way of uh, in my chapter I kind of work out that in terms of the time frame of the story he's He's, he's sort of left holding a Winchester carbine rifle, um, which was actually the, the weapon of choice of, of, the, um, uh, of Zapata's uh, uh, troops in the Mexican Revolution. So in a way, we can, the, it, it, it ends at the beginning of the, of the Mexican Revolution. If you actually look at the way that time works and the little sort of hints and, and codes. So I think that, you know, Steinbeck was fascinated in, in the Mexican Revolution as a sort of an ongoing revolution. Uh, Faulkner, of course, was not really interested in it at all. I don't think really ever comments on it, but Steinbeck was fascinated with it. And so I think it's this, he wants to recapture the possibilities of that revolution and to understand how it might continue. So that, that would be, I mean, these are just my interpretations, of course, but that's how I would read the Pearl. I think that's really fascinating to think about, yeah, the contextual cues and then, as you're saying, with the carbine, the ways that that's um, narrating, I mean, the emergence in that book being then the, the revolution outside the book. Right. And it's very different from his other works as well, because, you know, he, he has this idea of the, uh, what he calls the phalanx or the phalanx in which the individual becomes subsumed into a sort of super organism and loses their individuality and in, in this kind of hive mind whereas what you get in Kino is the individual is able to, to 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 sort of impact that community right rather than become the victim and, and sort of slot into a communal mindset like the Borg you know he's able actually to change that community and so it's a it's a kind of flip in in Steinbeck's thinking more generally around about that point. And he does become more interested in what we might call sort of individualism uh, later on in his, his career. Yeah, um, well, we've got about 10 minutes left. So I guess I've got at least one more question and then a sort of follow up about um, what's on the horizon for you. But I'm curious, um, we have a couple different questions about East of Eden. Uh, and let's see, one of them is asking if you're familiar with uh, whether or not Steinbeck was influenced by Thomas Mann and sort of thinking about relationships between Mann's thinking about time in the East of Eden. Another one is just saying is just asking how East of Eden fits into the Steinbeck canon and how it interacts with some of the themes 
Um, I know your book mostly focuses on sort of up to Cannery Row, so like a certain mm -hmm. biographical period, but maybe speculating from there on East of Eden. Right. Thoughts on how how some of this stuff that you cover comes up in East of Eden or what might be different. Right. Yeah, I um yeah, I don't actually treat East of Eden in the book. I decided that I wanted to follow Steinbeck uh during his time in California. So um actually Cannery Row is I think the first work that he writes in in, in New York City and then moves to the East Coast. Uh and in fact, you know, Steinbeck's people tend to forget this, like around about half of Steinbeck's writing career is spent on the East Coast. You know, he's very much a, a New York writer um, and, and, you know, produces some, you know, a kind of mixed, a mixed bag, <laughs> late Steinbeck. Um, Winter of Our Discontent, you know, his no sort of East Coast novel is well worth a read. And I think that that showed some of the earlier promise that may have helped. Uh, get him the Nobel Prize in 1962. Yeah, I didn't deal with East of Eden. I mean, it's a book that fascinates me in all sorts of ways. I can totally see the point about Thomas Mann and, and influence in that regard. I mean, I don't have a clear answer about that. Um, if I had written a chapter, um, then it probably would have focused on the character Lee, um, mm. who is who is the servant character. And, you know, he has Lee Chung in... in um, uh, Cannery Row, who's much more of a sort of orientalist um, uh, fantasy, you know, I mean, it's it's a much more problematic character, but but Lee is really, really important. Um, I mean, he's a servant in the book, literally, right, that's his character, but he's also a servant in the discourse of the novel, if you see what I mean, that is, he makes things happen. Um, he brings people together. He's, uh, and this isn't to dismiss him as, well, he's just a literary device because I think he's much, much more than that. Um, he's somebody that's very close, you know, Steinbeck, um, very close to kind of Steinbeck, the, the sort of the author figure controlling, you know, it's obviously deeply autobiographical, self-reflexive novel. Um, but, but Lee is fascinating because he's, it's almost perfectly bicultural, you know, I'd say he is perfectly bicultural. He, he lives in these two different worlds and he's able to, to bring these, these worlds together. So um, that would have been my focus if, if, if I was, you know, if I w had written like a, a bigger book that encapsulated all of Steinbeck, which I, I just didn't have the energy for, um, then that, that would have been my approach. Uh, but obviously it's, you know, I, I remember I actually hadn't read it before I started this project. It's a bit embarrassing. Um, of course, I did read it. It sort of just was kind of an amazing reading experience that I'm still processing. So I understand why there are questions um, uh, about it. Maybe one day I'll return to them in a little bit more detail. Yeah, and I think that bicultural frame is really interesting too, especially thinking about like for a lot of people, and certainly the internet, one of the big takeaways from that book is the Tim Shell, right? Like the ending mm -hmm. of like Almaeus, but even that as a sort of philosophical archival finding is coming from bicultural inquiry, right? Mm -hmm. Like Lee's ability to code switch is how we get to this sort of insight that's shared with the family. No, that's exactly right. Yeah, you see Steinbeck, the scholar, you know, doing that research. He was an amateur medievalist, you know, he translates more data. Um, you know, he ha has a deep history, a uh, deep interest in, in literary history, which is, of course, why he knows that, um, you know, werewolves don't come from Lon Chaney Jr. movies, but, but they actually, there's a, there's a more complex uh, 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 picture there. So, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, we got about five minutes left. I think, you know, famous last question is, what are you working on next? What's <clears throat> on the horizon? Okay. Well, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I really enjoyed, as I mentioned earlier, I really enjoyed the, the single author project. Um, so it allows for a kind of immersion in a particular writer. Um, it allows you to uh, sort of tell a story as well. Um, sometimes as literary critics, we don't do that very well. Historians tell the stories and we sort of analyze the stories. So uh, I like the idea of telling a story. So I think I'm going to work next uh, on a book about Zora Neale Hurston. 
um, figure that really interests me. She's very different from Steinbeck in, in all sorts of ways. Hurston dies in poverty and obscurity mm -hmm. in 1960, despite you know, having published more books um, than any other African-American woman at that point in her career. So she's, you know, deserves a, a, um, attention and uh, a serious focus. Um, so there are a, a series of differences, obviously, obvious differences, but also a series of parallels between Hearst and Steinbeck. So it's kind of rolling out of the Steinbeck uh, project. They had similar concerns with geography, Hurston's focused on Florida, obviously. Uh, Steinbeck's fo focused on California. They have similar, I mean, we were talking about this the other day. Uh, I mean, this is your idea. They have similar documentary sort of anthropological interests in working class people in the sort of the common person, uh, the, the folk, as, as, if you will. And they're also similarly politically ambivalent. You know, they're also difficult figures to pin down, you know, like Steinbeck, Hurston tends to vacillate politically between the radical and the conservative. You know, she was a, a, a Republican. She has, um, you know, some, some, you know, she, she, you, you can't really pin her down on a political spectrum very easily. Uh, so it's very like Steinbeck. So that, that really interests me. Um, and finally, she also, like Steinbeck, works in so many different genres and so many different media. She writes short stories, she writes plays. I've just discovered that she has a, a, a very rich career as a playwright. I hadn't realized it. Mm. You know, they're, they're recently discovered in the Library of Congress and published, uh, I mean, we all know about the play she wrote with Langston Hughes and, and her early play called Colorstruck, but she has this lifelong interest in drama. And so I'm, I'm really wanting to, to, to get into that. She wrote, um, anthropology, folklore, she made films, she was a photographer, uh, she was really interested in music, you know, she worked with Alan Lomax, the ethnomusicologist, she performs um, work songs, you know, for the Library of Congress, so there's a rich archive there, um, so I would love to get into Hurston, uh, what I'd like to do is um, teach it initially as a course at Stanford, so sort of do it in, in a similar way to the Steinbeck project. Uh, I mean, that's something I don't think we really got into in our discussion, kind of how this book is sort of different from um, other books that I've written in the sense that it grew out of a course, right? It, it, it grew out of conversation with uh, students and with TAs. It, it was very much a, a kind of dialogic process, just as Steinbeck himself, when he was writing, his writing habits were very dialogic. He was often writing books for other people. He was often sort of jotting things down in, 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 in the margins. And so this was a very dialogic uh, project uh, in which I really wanted to develop readings that would grab the attention of students, which isn't uh, always that easy. And to address that question, like, why are we reading this? Why are we reading this today? Students want to know that. Why shouldn't they know that? Um, so that some of that energy, I hope, is in my Steinbeck book, and I hope some of that energy will get into my uh, ongoing and upcoming um, project on Zora Neale Hurston. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we're at about three o'clock, so I think that's a good time to wrap it up. Um, thank you, Gavin, for a wonderful conversation. Thank you, everyone, for your uh, questions in the Q and A. Um, and yeah. Um, yeah, and thank you, Daniel. Thank you for this invitation, Bruce and uh, the Bill Lane Center. Thank you, American Studies and English. Thank you to all of the local scholars here, Mary Ellen Hannibal, Susan Schillinglaw, who's helped me. Thanks to all the librarians. You know who you are, Rebecca Wingfield, Peter Van Kutren. It's been a very communal project and it's been great to, to work on it. Thank you.